Hi everyone, I'm Mateusz. Uh, I'm based in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Warsaw University of Technology, which is this lovely building over here. Uh, I've also worked at Apple in London, and I've worked at some uh, other cool companies as well. But for the past 10 years or so, I've also been a professional musician. Uh, my primary instrument is drums, but I also play a little bit of synthesizers, and I do a little bit of music production. And over the years, I've been very fortunate to play uh, with some amazing Polish artists. Um, I've played hip hop with Grupson. I've been a part of The Dumplings, a very Polish name indeed, uh, which is a popular synth pop band. Uh, I've played very sad and very soulful music with Marek Dyak, and I've played very cheerful music with Majka Jezowska, who is uh, somewhat of a children's music legend in Poland. And the case with children is they grow up and they start attending music festivals, and this is where you end up. And along with uh, Michał Milczarek and Bartek Łuczkiewicz, we also have a um, jazz trio that we've been very fortunate to tour uh, internationally quite a bit. Um, I've also played with some terrible bands, and I've had shows canceled because there were zero tickets sold. Uh, so I had the full spectrum of experiences um, of being a musician. And I work in this interdisciplinary research area that kind of combines music and artificial intelligence, digital signal programming, computer science, and the whole kitchen sink of other disciplines. And it's known as MIR, which stands for Music Information Retrieval. Um, so the goals of MIR are processing music in useful ways, um, generating new, previously unheard musical content, as well as in the process, hopefully, enhancing our perception of music. Um, so let's jump right in and see, first of all, how we can interact with music using Python. So this is a pedal board. This is a device that you would plug a, your guitar or synthesizer in uh, in order to modify its sound. Each of these little pedals um, may be a different effect, so you, you uh, may have like an echo or like a compressor or like a reverb. And Pedalboard is uh, also the name of an awesome audio processing library developed by Spotify. Um, it emulates many popular effects and since a couple of weeks uh, also supports third-party VST plugins, which is just awesome and it's actually very easy to use. And by very easy to use, I mean you just import what you need, you create an instance of a pedal board, then you instantiate the effects with, uh, with some parameters that you need, and you just run your audio through the board. Um, it's as simple as that. So the next time you're creating perhaps a presentation and you're uh, recording your voice, uh, you can give your voice that little bit of magic uh, using Python, which is just great. Um, Another library is called Pio, and this time it's a low-level digital signal processing library. Um, it also has a synthesis engine, so you can implement your own synthesizer and actually play melodies with this library. And what's even cooler is that it's very fast, so it's suitable for live performances. And um, a couple of EuroPython conferences ago, actually, uh, there was this amazing presentation by Mathieu Amiga, who uh, has an ensemble that plays traditional, medieval, and Renaissance music on like traditional instruments, which is, I mean, like it's amazing on its own. Uh, but what's even more interesting is they use um, Pio scripts, which are running during the show. Uh, they have custom loopers and effects implemented, which are integral part of their show. Uh, so Python is almost like a, another band member uh, when they're playing. So it's just fantastic. Um, another library uh, is Librosa, which is uh, a audio processing, visualization, and feature extraction library. Um, it's very feature rich and it has uh, really sensible uh, default parameters for many of the operations. So you can actually learn about digital signal uh, processing while you're getting familiar with the API of this library. And the API is functional, so think uh, more in terms of like NumPy rather than scikit-learn. Uh, and Librosa over the years has become kind of the research uh, and industry standard for music analysis. So if you want to create perhaps a spectrogram, which is a standard way of visualizing audio, this is how we can do it using Librosa. Uh, so 
there's just uh, there's just the uh, imports. Then we are loading a sample of a trumpet, which call uh, which comes bundled with the library. Then we're calling the STFT function, which stands for uh, short-term Fourier transform, which is the operation that we need, uh, whatever that means. Then we're just rescaling it to decibels, and there's even a uh, a set of special functions that allow you to uh, visualize your features. And this is what we get. This is uh, a visualization of the mixture of frequencies that uh, can be found in our signal. Um, so far, we've only been talking about one representation of music, uh, which is audio. So something that we can directly listen back to, something that's listenable. Uh, so perhaps it's a WAV file or it's stored in an MP3 file. But this is not the only representation of music that's interesting for us. Um, there's also what's called symbolic music, and the original uh, OG symbolic format is just sheet music, so it's music that's written on a sheet of paper. Uh, you can't listen back to paper, but you can give it to a musician who can per perform it uh, for you, and this is how you would listen back actually to, to what's written on the paper. Uh, and in the digital realm, uh, we use also some symbolic formats like MIDI or ABC or MXL and in this case we would run this through a synthesizer or import this into a digital audio workstation uh, and this is how we would uh, listen back to music in symbolic formats. But so just uh, the key distinction is audio is immediately listenable to and symbolic music is not. And Python also has a rich ecosystem of libraries for working with um, music in symbolic formats. Um, so the gold standard seems to be pretty MIDI uh, by Colin Raffle. Um, it, it allows you to process, uh, read, and edit MIDI. Uh, a wonderful library is MusePy, which also has some automated uh, functions for uh, analysis and metrics. And one of the newer ones from the bunch is called MIDI Talk, uh, which enables you to use some MIDI tokenizers. And MIDI tokenizers are needed uh, to work, um, to make MIDI work with some of the newer uh, machine learning models, uh, for instance, like transformers. Okay, I've uttered the words machine learning, uh, so let's see what we can actually learn from music and what are the uh, most common, uh, some of the most common uh, MIR tasks. So music tagging is kind of the mother of all uh, music information retrieval tasks. We start off with some music, we run it through a model, and this will most usually be a neural network, uh, and we expect to get some tag uh, as the output. So in this case, this is an instance of genre recognition or genre classification, so the tag that we get is rock. Uh, but in most cases, uh, we are interested in a bunch of tags uh, that are uh, non-exclusive. So we may ask about tags that um, tell us about the genre, about the instrumentation, perhaps uh, about the decade, perhaps about the mood of the music. And this is, this is, um, this is a very important task because automated methods of analyzing the contents of, of, of music is uh, one of the things that really powers recommender systems and that really um, powers all analytical systems when it comes to music. Uh, and the good news is many of the state-of-the-art uh, music tagging models uh, have very good, very, uh, very well-written open implementations in PyTorch, uh, so you can just start exploring right away uh, and just see uh, through the whole timeline. Another interesting MIR task is what is known as source separation. So again, we start off with some music, we run it through a model, and this will also, uh, in most cases, be a neural network, and we expect to kind of break down the audio into individual instruments. Now, a couple of years ago, this was like magic, and this was like almost every mixing or mastering engineer's uh, dream to have this, and this is very much the reality right now. Um, the most common setting is uh, source separation into four sources, uh, vocals, drums, bass, and other, and this is only because of uh, the way the first data sets for source separation were built, but other options are also possible. And a very popular and well-known model for source separation uh, is, is DMUX. This was released by Facebook, or Meta, in 2020. 
Um, it is what is known as a U-net type of uh, neural network architecture, and it looks absolutely terrifying. And that's why we are not going to explain it, but we are going to listen to it. So I've prepared this short little beat, uh, especially for this conference. Okay, and I've already pip installed DMAX. Uh, so let's try to source separate it. Uh, you can also specify the options into how many tracks you are separating. In this case, we just want to separate the drums from the whole rest. Okay, looks like something worked. Looks like we've got a folder. Let's listen to how this actually sounds. So this is no drums. This is drums. So that's DMUX, just fantastic. Awesome little tool to have. Thank you. Some other source separation models that are also um, available and you can play with is um, our splitter by Deezer, also works really well. And there's uh, also this library call, called um, Nozzle by Ethan Manlo at the Northwestern University. And this library also contains some more classical models like matrix factorization, so it's not only deep learning. Another very interesting uh, MIR task is music representations. So we start off with music uh, or some audio, but audio is like hundreds of thousands of numbers. This is a very heavy data type for computers. And what we would like to have is actually some other compressed representation that's still meaningful in some way. It might not be uh, relevant or meaningful to a human, but it is to a machine. And I think that you already know where this is going. Uh, let's just ask a neural network to produce this. Um, so, so, oh, and these uh, representations are known as embeddings. So one of the most known embedding models is OpenL3. Um, this is also something you can pip install. Uh, it has a very nice command line interface. Um, and this is actually two neural networks that were trained uh, in a visual, uh, audiovisual correspondence task. So basically, we are training a neural network to determine whether what we are seeing is the same as what we are hearing. And we are using uh, clips or frames from a video and one second of audio, and we are trying to uh, determine whether uh, those come from, uh, from the same clip. And in the process of doing that, the neural network learns to produce these compact representations which can be further used in some downstream tasks. Um, another model, a newer one, is called CLAP. Uh, and here uh, we are trying to match the audio with a text description. Um, so now we are, we are producing uh, embeddings based on a text description, so we are basically learning whether what we are hearing is the same that we are reading about. Uh, and this will come in handy in just a few, uh, in just a few minutes. Um, so you can try this model out uh, either from the official uh, repo from Microsoft or also since uh, quite recently, thanks to Hugging Face, you can just uh, import the CLAP model from Transformers, which is just amazing. And this is just scratching the surface. I mean, there's, there's, there's a plethora of uh, music information retrieval tasks like transcription and beat, beat and pitch tracking, um, sheet music optical recognition, uh, artist similarity analysis, etc., etc. But one thing that has been recently getting really, really uh, a lot of attention is generative AI. So let's also take a look uh, at um, how we can generate music using AI. So again, we've got two settings, audio or symbolic music. Uh, in terms of audio, we will be talking about neural audio synthesis, which is like a fancy term for generating audio. And for symbolic music generation, what we will be doing is actually uh, only composing music uh, using AI and leaving the rendering and uh, 
uh, creating the actual sound to, to someone else. So let's take a look at symbolic music generation first because it's the easier setting. Um, there's this paper from 2016 that I really like for, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. It's called Music Transcription Modeling and Composition Using Deep Learning. Um, the authors use a recurrent neural network, which by today's standard is a pretty simple model. Um, they use music in what's known as the ABC format, which is basically text with some additional metadata. Uh, it can be further rendered down into MIDI, and that can be further rendered down into audio, so it's, it's, uh, you can listen back to, to it. Uh, so this is basically like uh, the task of predicting the next character in a sequence of text. And I really like this paper also because the authors provide uh, a very nice uh, musical analysis of the results. Um, so mind you, this is, this is not the newest model at all, but they find that uh, what they are able to generate uh, follows the typical style of traditional Irish music, which is what they were training on. It has correct repetition, variation, um, harmony, rhythm. Uh, the, the results are checked against the data set for originality in order to determine uh, if the network isn't just memorizing everything. And what they find is it makes no glaring mistakes, which is pretty nice. And this idea of kind of using uh, language modeling in order to um, enable um, AI-assisted composition has been played with and developed quite a bunch. Uh, also by the people at Google, uh, there's a team called Google Magenta, which is kind of like their um, creative AI division. And they proposed a bunch of models. Uh, and let's just listen to one of those, and this will be the Music Transformer from 2018. That's pretty nice, right? Uh, it has a clear uh, feeling of forward motion. Uh, it has these slight tempo shifts that are uh, pretty characteristic for um, classical music. Um, it's coherent over several seconds. Um, so, uh, so yeah, transformers are used also for um, composing music and. Uh, these ideas are still being developed, and right now we are in the process of looking for ways uh, to actually incorporate this into real musicians' workflows and enhance human creativity with it. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the second case, which is neural audio synthesis, which is generating audio. So this is a hard problem, uh, because audio is a very heavy um, data format, because audio for a computer is just a super long uh, one-dimensional vector of numbers. Uh, so basically, when we are generating audio, what we are doing is we are modeling uh, very complex and abstract and very human relationships uh, between thousands of samples that sometimes are millions of samples apart. Um, so the initial idea uh, how to do it uh, was to kind of muscle through this problem uh, in an autoregressive fashion and just generate audio sample by sample, uh, and this is pre-attention. So we are just looking back at the previous samples in a hierarchical order and trying to generate um, sample by sample. And I'm gonna do a pretty big segue over here. Uh, let's segue to 2020. Uh, the idea of how to do uh, neural audio synthesis has changed quite a lot because uh, nowadays we are mostly using um, encoder decoder models. So we are trying to come up with a compressed space that kind of encapsulates the character of our audio. Um, and then decode, uh, decode and produce some music out of it. So one of the models that work in this fashion uh, is Jukebox by OpenAI. It's a model that as its input takes the genre, uh, the style and some lyrics. Uh, and let's listen to an example of how rock in the style of Elvis Presley uh, could sound when hallucinated by OpenAI's uh, model. Dusty tiny humble scarf, but the little hitch tells the heart. When my toes slips, 
I mean, you can hear some artifacts, but still, that's, that's scary good at times. Um, and people have been playing around with this, uh, sometimes in, in really crazy ways. Uh, there's uh, one of my favorite examples is this um, programmer slash musician duo uh, Databots. Uh, and these are guys who create uh, infinite live streams of AI-generated music, and my favorite one is called Relentless Doppelganger, and it's an uh, infinite live stream of technical death metal that has been playing on YouTube for almost four years as of now. It's playing 24-7, uh, great style, uh, great, great stuff. Highly recommended. But again, we are also looking for ways uh, how to incorporate this into actual musicians' workflows. And uh, a great example would be Rave from 2021. This is a variational autoencoder for fast and high quality neural audio synthesis. Um, basically, what it is doing it is learning to uh, recreate audio. And by recreating audio, it's creating this kind of internal representation which compresses the characteristics of our audio. And inside of that internal representation, it's also learning trajectories to take advantage of the temporal structure of music. So basically what that means is if you train a rave model on Darbuka, it's gonna produce more Darbuka for you or change your audio into Darbuka. If you train it on Antonin Dvořák, it's going to change your audio into whatever it thinks Antonin Dvořák sounds like. And if you, if you train it on your voice, it's going to change your audio or produce more of what it thinks your voice sounds like. Um, so let's take a listen to Rave. This is, again, the beat that I created for, for today's talk. This is how Rave uh, reimagines that beat as a darbuka. And this is how Rave, uh, trained on voice, reimagines that beat uh, as voice. <laughs> So this is like an amazing tool for all of these like glitchy patches that would be really difficult to produce using like traditional synthesis. I absolutely love it. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, and the last family of uh, neural audio synthesis models that I would like to talk about are text to music models. So this is kind of like a chat GPT for music. So you input a text description and music comes out. And these are very involved and uh, very modern and very uh, complex models. Uh, one of them was published uh, January this year. It's called MusicLM, it's also from Google. It's basically a neural network made out of three other neural networks. There's one part known as the neural codec, which, uh, which is responsible for uh, actually generating the audio. There's another part uh, which is responsible for creating semantic tokens, which basically means making the sense of a, of a sequence of audio. And there's another part uh, which is responsible for making sure that what we are generating uh, and, and the audio that we are processing matches the text description. Remember the clap model that we talked about earlier, the embedding model? This is, this is where it is used, uh, although this is not the clap model. Um, it's a different one. It's a proprietary one. Uh, also, literally a couple of weeks ago, uh, Meta AI proposed their own text-to-music model. Um, it's called MusicGen. Uh, and the paper was titled Simple and Controllable Music Generation. Uh, whenever you see simple as the first uh, word of the title of a paper, you know, you can expect like maybe it's not really that simple, but the model does sound pretty good. And that's like a pretty high level description. So uh, we're getting close and we're really doing interesting things in this space. 
Okay, so wow, we've covered a lot of ground uh, and yet barely scratched the surface. Uh, but let's summarize. Um, I hope I've been able to uh, convince you that MIR, Music Information Retrieval, uh, enables new experiences both for listeners and for creators. Um, I think that we can agree upon that uh, autonomous uh, music AI is still kind of immature, um, but it already enhances human creativity in, no in novel and interesting ways. Um, and I think that I was able to convince you that Python has a really, really rich uh, ecosystem for working with music. Uh, you can find me everywhere on the internet under the handle Mamodzejewski, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you about music information retrieval. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so please come here to ask. First of all, wow. Uh, second of all, thank you for promoting the beautiful pink building of our university. Uh, very nostalgic to me. And uh, third of all, um, I'm also trying to make music, but to play as an amateur. And recently I was looking into uh, sampling, into longer samples, but also in the context of the last example that you showed of um, AI generating quite a beautiful piece of music. I have very bad musical hearing, probably non-existent, so can you recommend something for making it easy for me, like uh, using AI for transcribing it back to MIDI, back to notes? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, there's a model that was released, I believe, uh, the previous year. It's called Basic Pitch. Uh, it was developed by Spotify, and it's a really, really good um, transcription model. So you just uh, you can you can hum into your microphone, or you can you can put in a, a a piece of audio and it transcribes it into into MIDI and it works really well. And if you just write AI transcription, there's there's a bunch of other approaches for that um, as well. So that that would be where I would start. Basic pitch. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Great talk. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the emerging genre Algorave. Uh, I was just really interested, like, how quick are these models? You, you talked about, like, the live stream, but is, is there a latency? Like, are these models quick enough to use live? Yeah, so some of these models are and some aren't. So the Rave model, the one that was changing uh, stuff to Darbuka and to, and to voice, that one is uh, 20 to 80 times faster than real time on CPU. So that one is like extremely fast. You can deploy it inside of a VST plugin and you can play with it live, absolutely. But some of the more involved models, um, you have to wait a bit for, for, for the results. So if I were looking for something to play with live, I would start with Rave, definitely. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, so many synthesizers today have like really complex engines, right? So they are capable of reproducing like a wide variety of sounds. So an increasing kind of, you know, challenge is actually coming up with the presets for them, right? So could like, you know, machine learning help us actually reproduce sounds that we tell it or just produce a wide variety? Like how, how can we, you know, generate presets from an existing sound engine? Uh, abs absolutely, I mean like uh, a big part of a producer's uh, work is looking for snare drum samples that don't sound like garbage, right? Exactly. Uh, or like tw twink tweaking the presets of your synthesizer. And that's also a very active research area. Um, I don't remember names of specific models, yeah. but uh, there are models that you can feed in some samples and they basically generate more of the stuff that, they, uh, that you fed into them. And there are also ideas for like differentiable synthesizers. So if you make um, all of the electronic circuits, the emulations, uh, the operations, the, mathem the mathematical operations differentiable, uh, you basically get like a neural network that's a synthesizer. And you can like train it on uh, other sounds and you can basically like synthesize sound directly using a neural network. And there's also ideas for um, learning the parameters of some presets of synthesizers um, in order to to, to use that in actual musical musical workflows as well. So this is absolutely also a, a active research area. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We don't have any more time for any more questions. 
so please reach out to Mateusz on the hallways or on Discord if you have any other questions. Uh, I, I think he'll be happy to answer any. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.